Henry Nicole interviewing for the Living Legends Tape Library, a project of the Oklahoma Historical Society with offices at Oklahoma Christian College. The following is an interview with Mrs. John B. Frizzell, F-R-I-Z-Z-E-L-L. She is a former professor at Oklahoma City University and presently on the board of directors of the Oklahoma Historical Society. The main purpose of this interview is to hear about the Centennial Battlefield Overland Mail Celebration of 1958, in which she and her family took part. This interview is being made in Oklahoma City on January 30th, 1974. Before we begin the great adventure, Mildred, I understand that you have a cocktail biography I'd like very much to hear. <coughs> okay, Hayden, I'm a West Virginian by birth. I am an Oklahoman by adoption. I am a geologist by training, a teacher by profession, a mother by choice, and a neophyte historian by accident. <laughs> well, that is indeed a brief biography, but an admirable one. I'd like to ask you now, Mildred, about the very beginning of your trip. How was the start of it? The start was a real blast start. It was bedlam. An early autumn rain coming down in sheets, driven by a cold north wind, soaked everything and everybody who ventured out on the morning of September the 16th, 1958. As we attempted to reenact at the railway station in Tipton, Missouri, the departure of a century ago, John Butterfield's first westbound stagecoach, destination San Francisco, some 2,795 miles via the great Oxbow route of the Overland Mail. Father John Frizzell's prize four in hand a match bay harnessed to the stagecoach was standing by the uh, station platform, soaked to the skin. Their heads, usually held high, looking for trouble, were drooping with streams of water running off their noses. Johnny, our 18-year-old son, who pulled the stagecoach between the stops on a special trailer attached to his huge truck, and Billy, our wrangler, who drove our horse-drawn van, stood in pools of water at the heads of the leaders, just in case the horses did not like the sound of the approaching iron horse that was already more than ten minutes late. Father John, wrapped in a board poncho, was on the box, trying his best to hold on to the water-soaked reins that were as slippery as eels. Along with hundreds of other people, I sought refuge in the nearby fire department building. My new long blue taffeta dress, made in the style of a century ago, especially for this centennial, was a sad sight indeed. It was not only soaked to the knees, but splattered with mud as I ran from building to building trying to get close enough to see the arrival of the train and the transfer of the mails carried by the elderly grandson of John Butterfield, Mr. Charles W. Child, Utica, New York. This was the climax of a week-long series of historic events that the Founding Fathers of Tipton had worked on for months. They decided to add a little color to the arrival of the mail team by having some mounted bandits gallop up and grab the mail bag. But the rain was no respecter of bandits, and they, were, they too were soaked. They were so wet they could not even keep the red bandanas up over their noses as, it, as they anxiously waited for the action to start. Al Ferris, the Butterfield Centennial Caravan blacksmith, was there with his two anvils. This was what Father John dreaded the most of all, because our team had never witnessed an anvil salute. Now, that was the way the pioneers welcomed the arrival of the stages in California. Al was an expert at this, but the rain was on our side. Working under a raincoat, Al turned one anvil upside down on the railroad platform, filled it with black powder, laid in a fuse, put the other anvil right side up on top of it. But the, uh, uh, the fuse had absorbed enough water uh, that it did not go off when the mail arrived. This sound of an eight-pounder would certainly have sent 
the horses straight up into the air, even in the rain. One of the most amusing scenes, uh, things that happened during the, these last moments of Bedlam, was the mayor of Tipton running around frantically trying to find the American flag to run upon the flagpole for this great occasion. While he was searching for it, Uncle Ben Dixon, historian, spiritual leader of our caravan, and assistant to, uh, director of the Butterfield Overland Mail Centennial, mm -hmm. uh, took advantage of these embarrassing moments for a good joke. He reached in his car, pulled out the state flag of California with a great bear on it, and ran it up on the pole. There it tipped him. So for a few agonizing moments, California ruled over Tipton until the mayor found the lost flag. Dear Captain Vernon Brown, Tulsa, Oklahoma, who had asked us to join the caravan because we had the stagecoach and horses, uh, is a senior pilot with the American Airlines and was national coordinator of our Butterfield Centennial Caravan. Now, he, on this wet morning, had deserted his wife, Fern, and their four children in his station wagon, parked some distance away from the station. While he stood by the stagecoach, soaked to the skin, waiting to help in the elderly Mr. Child, whom we had been warned had a serious heart condition, into the stagecoach, which was cozy and warm with the leather curtains tightly buttoned down and the glass windows closed. Now, what he did not know was that our daughter, Manette, age 14, who'd already made friends with the teenage sons of Captain Brown, were the only smart ones out of the thousands of people who came to witness this historical book. They got together and decided the place to be was inside the stagecoach, where they could be dry and still see everything. In one of my mad dashes, out of the building to tell Johnny to get out of that pool of water he was standing in. It would ruin his only pair of boots. I met Ed and Alberta Constant, dear friends who'd driven down from Independence, Missouri, to see our departure. And uh, they played an interesting part uh, in the conclusion of this scene. Because Ormsby reports in his diary that when the stage pulled out of Tipton, there was only one man he spoke up, and he simply said, Goodbye, John. And at the end of this centennial uh, at the station, when John finally pulled out with the stagecoach, uh, everybody was so wet and so cold that I heard only the voice of Alberta Constance say, Goodbye, John. Young Graham Kolauer, the young photographer who wanted to go along and take pictures and make a movie of the trip, was snapping pictures from every angle as the train finally arrived. After what seemed like hours, here came the elderly Mr. Child. But he couldn't carry the bag of mail as Butterfield had a century ago because it was an enormous bag. He had to enlist the help of one of the young local greeters. As they ushered Mr. Childs to the stagecoach, a photographer called out, Put Childs up on the box with the driver. Throw the mail on top of the stage. Now, it was no problem to hoist the mailbag up on top of the stage, but getting Mr. Childs up there was a real donny bit. The only way you can mount the box of a stagecoach is by starting with your left foot, which is very awkward. Uh, otherwise, you have to wind up your legs about midway, due to the position of the steps up this hazardous course. Unfortunately, no one had told Mr. Child how to start to mount the box to the stagecoach in the down pit. So he started with his right foot. Now you can go just so far using your starting on your right foot, and then you have, that you have to stop or wind up your legs, cross over your legs. He had on a trench coat with large slit pockets. The slit, one of these slit pockets got caught on the iron wing of the railing of the box, and poor Mr. Childs was helpless. He couldn't get up, and he couldn't get down. Finally, a group of men literally lifted him up on the box for the photographer's picture. 
Then in the middle of everything, William B. Carell, United States Post Office ma uh, officer in charge of the motorized highway post office number one that was to carry the philatelic mail and leave the caravan, appeared on the scene and grabbed the mail bag. The, uh, the photographers uh, complained uh, and the bandits pleaded with him to leave it up there just a few moments longer. But he was a stern man, and he said, you have no right to play with the U.S. mail. So he grabbed the mail and <laughs> ran. The rest of us were having a little fun along with replaying history. Then the big problem was to get Charles down from the box. But the same crew of rescue workers reappeared and lifted him down. And it was not long, and the captain down opened the door of the stagecoach to put him safely inside. And then he saw the children. They scattered like a covey of uh, quail and uh, soon reported to their respective cars. Mr. Johnson, a local meat packer, uh, who had a big garage nearby, invited John to drive the whole entourage in there out of the rain uh, to unhook and load up while we went home, put on dry clothes and lined up behind hypo number one and headed west out of Tipton, just as John Butterfield had said a century ago, boy, nothing on God's earth must stop the United States mail. What were the jobs of each of the Frizzells? Well, the Frizzells were kept mighty bu busy every minute of the 24 days we were on the road. Manette was perhaps the busiest, had the greatest variety of jobs. First, there were her school assignments that she was supposed to keep up to date. At each stop, she also had postcards of the stagecoach, uh, which she sold and uh, hoped to make her spending money. Then, uh, she also helped in the highway post office when uh, the, the mailman would get bogged down with an avalanche of philatelic letters. She'd get right in there and help them uh, transfer. Uh, the uh, letters, but most important of all, she would ride Big Red, the fifth horse, a, a horse that John insisted on taking along, just in case one of his show team went lame or was injured. Now, Big Big Red was a thoroughbred, and he soon caught on to the idea that he was missing out on too much of the excitement by being left in the van and started kicking the sides out at each stop. So to avoid wrecking our van, Manette rode him in each parade. Her most droma dramatic moment was when she made the final ride up Market Street, San Francisco, on September the 10th, 1958, our last parade. Johnny was responsible for loading and unloading, booming down the stagecoach to the trailer, in addition to keeping the harness for each horse uh, separated and in order so that it could be switched on without delay at the stop where uh, we were to parade. Since Billy was just an average wrangler, Johnny had the added responsibility of checking uh, each horse, making sure it was snubbed correctly in the van, find a place to stay each night for the horses, which is usually the fairgrounds provided by the local citizens. But the hardest job of all was he had to get up at 5.30 each morning to see that the horses were fed and watered so they'd be ready to take off at 7.30 in the morning. Father John, who was recovering from serious surgery, did most of the driving, even though there were times when it was difficult for him to mount the box. Now, who is Father John? Father John is uh, the uh, nickname that we have lovingly given Father uh, John D. Frizzell Sr. to separate, uh, keep him separate from uh, John Jr. So uh, everybody picked up uh, this uh, uh, nickname, and he was known from coast to coast as Father John. Now my job was be was to be the chronicler, and I attempted to keep a diary of our activities. But that soon became dull and routine, and occasionally I got out of character, according to some of the local editors who wrote. There was a tall lady in a big black hat that seemed to be telling everybody just what to do. Since I was the only lady with a big hat, I had to confess my guilt. My what, did you wear? what did you wear? 
Well, my traveling wardrobe was very simple. I took two outfits, one for warm weather and the other for cold weather. Having just passed through the circuit of local club, uh, club presidencies, I was dressed as Madam President rather than as a working member of a traveling history circus. With my big hat covered with large cabbage roses made of black silk, realizing how ridiculous I looked uh, uh, helping harness the horses with a pack on, I put it in the trunk of the car where it remained for the rest of the trip. But by a strange and wonderful experience, Nanette and I each received an elegant Civil War period ball gown, which we wore at the former banquet given for the caravan in Fort Smith, Arkansas, <coughs> to reenact the ball given a century earlier upon the arrival, following the arrival of Butterfield and the first westbound uh, state. It started the year before when Manette was working out the horses in the state church at Frontier City, USA. I was in our state office when a lovely lady came by with her small grandson and asked if he could ride on the state church. I could tell she was exhausted and I invited her to come in and rest while he was having fun on the stage. We were soon talking about the Frizzell's uh, proposal to join the Butterfield Overland Centennial the next year, and she asked, do you have any dresses of that period? No, I lamented, and I continued. I must get busy on the sewing machine. No more was said, and we waved goodbye as she hurried off, trying to keep up with her young grandson, who had plans for more exciting things to do. And lo, in about two months, here came a big box from a small town in Connecticut. When I opened it, there were two elegant ball gowns. Handmade in New York City, according to the signs, uh, so do me, with no forwarding address. So someone made us very happy. These gowns are carefully packed away on the third floor and shown only on rare occasions. What old roads did you pass? I understand you passed some very bitter sights. Yes, we passed some of the most bitter battles of the Civil War. Uh, <coughs> the old Overland Trail uh, passed first uh, the Elkhorn Station, which is uh, on the side of the Battle of Pea Ridge, where three great Confederate generals lost their lives, Generals McCullough, McIntosh, and Slack. Seated on the front porch of the old tavern was Mrs. Scott in her 90s, whose grandmother, as a little girl, helped care for the wounded Confederates brought into their home. On this quiet, peaceful lawn, that beautiful afternoon, Al set up the anvil to lead to those three great generals. As a Yankee, whose great-grandfather fought on the Union side, I was invited to set off the salute which means to light the fuse and run like eight. What was the most dangerous moment of the rerun? Although the stagecoach had run out of gas one place, got stuck in the mud in another place, came loose and rolled off the trailer while it was going 60 miles an hour at another time, its nearest touch to disaster was Logstown uh, Hill, Van Buren, Arkansas. In addition to an auto repair truck and the State Highway Patrol, our friend Ruri Ann Park, wife of the editor of the Press Argus, came up to northern Arkansas to meet us and urge us on to Van Buren on time because they had a grand celebration planned down by the courthouse. So the Frizzell entourage left the caravan and hurried on to the top of Logtown Hill because we had to uh, hitch up the stagecoach. And Logtown Hill was famous back in the Butterfield days uh, for two reasons. First, uh, it was one of the steepest hills on the whole route, and it was a dangerous uh, trip down the uh, hill. Uh, second, because the conductor always blew his bugle at the crest of the hill. 
Now, this was to warn the ferry on the Arkansas River to please uh, stay or come over to the Van Buren side of the river. So, uh, uh, in the, during the last hundred years, a black top covering was put on the old road down Logtown Hill and had covered up uh, the century-old rocks of the Butterfield State. This was very unfortunate, because in driving a stagecoach, the delicate use of the brake is as important as the reins on a steep hill. If you put too much pressure on the brake, the hind wheels will start skidding, and that will cause the vehicle to start swerving from side to side and could eventually turn it over. On the black top, uh, there was nothing uh, to help uh, create more friction, and uh, Father John had a real toy before him. <coughs> we arrived at the crest of Logtown Hill in plenty of time, complete with bugles. Whit Frizzell took one look at the road and said, Boys, get busy and reline those brake shoes or we'll never make it. They took an old tire and cut it in pieces and nailed it onto the brake shoes. Now, this was a great help because we'd already practically worn out uh, a pair of uh, pads on uh, the brake shoes. Then here came the VIPs who were to ride down the hill to the courthouse in the stagecoach and join the big parade. Now among them was the mayor of Van Buren and his beautiful wife. There was the editor of the Press Argus and uh, Zuri Ann, his wife. And at the given signal, uh, those of us who have ever driven a stagecoach each said a silent prayer. The bugle blew his horn, and off they went down Logtown Hill. Now the team immediate, immediately wanted to start running rather than to hold back the weight of the coach. There was no friction, uh, not enough friction on the wheel so that the brake couldn't hold the coach back. So John confessed later that he drove one wheel, got one wheel off on the gravel. That helped some. But he kept a telephone pole in sight every instant of the time. Just in case those horses had decided to run, he was going to wrap the whole thing around the nearest pole. Later, those inside the stagecoach admitted the danger of the venture and did a lot of silent prayer. But we finally made it, they finally made it to the foot of the hill and everyone could then relax. We thought there was Dr. Muriel Wright, Dr. George Sherrick, and his sister Lucille, who had all come over from Oklahoma to meet us. John was still on the box when some Oklahoma Indians, in their colorful costumes, walked out in front of the uh, horses and started their war dance. That did it. The leaders stood up on their hind legs, fell over backwards on the wheelers, knocked them down, rolled over, and it was a puzzle to figure out which horse was which. Johnny and the Wrangler came running to the scene and helped untangle the horses. Luckily, there were no injuries, just a few patches of hair missing here and there. Uh, what were the problems that you encountered, or what was your very first problem? Well, uh, this sounds silly, but it was the truth. <laughs> we couldn't find the road, and we couldn't stay together. We were always getting lost. Uh, the car each caravan member had been given a list of towns that, uh, in which the caravan would stop for a celebration. But there was no map. Now, there were many roads entering each of these towns on our list. So if we got out of sight of uh, the rest of the caravan, we were completely lost. Now, it started, we started out with the hypo leaving the caravan. 
Well, we soon found that wasn't uh, going to work because the driver didn't know anything about any state except California. And Bill Carell, the uh, uh, director, uh, didn't know anything about any area except Washington, D.C. So we said, well, let's try proof, as we lovingly referred to Reverend Charles Arnold from the Christian Church at Tulsa, who joined the caravan as uh, our chaplain. But Preet, uh, he knew Oklahoma and Arkansas like the back of his hand, simply drove too fast for the old mail bus. So finally, we uh, pitched him out of number one position and left it up to Ben Dixon and Captain Vernon Brown. And even they got lost at time, especially the day we crossed Oklahoma, which was a nightmare. We were supposed to stop at 24 towns. Some of the ver caravan missed as much as, as many as half of the 24 towns. A big celebration had been planned for us at Durant that night, and of all things, that was the time the Jeep ran out of gas, and there sat the stagecoach helpless along the side of the road. The horses had gone on. They were in Durant waiting for the stagecoach to be hooked up. So John and I w jumped in the car, went back over the road, and there we found Johnny in his desperate state. We soon found gas and had the, uh, the, had the stagecoach, and there the jeep headed back to direct. Now that mor morning, the stage following the priest and the blacksmith had gone into the swamp area near Walker's grave uh, at Scullerville, where they were supposed to have the celebration. But unfortunately, it had rained the night before. Now, this was one time when we were simply delighted that most of the caravan was late arriving at the scene because we got there in time to see that it was a swamp and that we were going to stay out. But as always, our friends appeared and pulled uh, the stagecoach and the preacher and the, bu and the Butterfield blacksmith out of the mire, and we were on our way once more. There must have been some romantic moments, were there? Yes, there were many. The most romantic moment of all to me was the night we spent in Anson, Texas where we met my old college geology buddy, Ellen Posey, who was working on a well nearby and had driven over to see us. Now, she knew that part of Texas uh, very well. She knew every road. She said, uh, this is a beautiful moonlight night. She said, uh, why don't we all get in my big station wagon and drive over and see Phantom Hill in the moonlight? just as Ormsby and the first westbound stagecoach had seen it a century ago. It was truly an eerie sight. We wanted to get out and walk around, but we were afraid of rattlesnakes. So we parked and had a moment of silence for Ormsby and the first westbound stage. We imagined we could see them coming up the hill in our mind's eye. Who was Ormsby? I remember he was on the trip. Uh, Ormsby was a reporter for the New York Herald. And uh, in the, at the time the Butterfield started, most people in the East thought that it was an impossible attempt, that it was, we could not possibly cross the desert, mountains, and plains uh, through Indian country with a stagecoach. So when, uh, when uh, Butterfield announced uh, his uh, date of departure, the New York Herald bought the only three tickets on that first uh, westbound stage and sent young Waterman L. Ormsby, one of their star reporters, and they, they told him, you keep a diary and let us know whether this will actually succeed. I imagine his reports were really read with interest. How was your greatest historic thrill on this trip? 
Well, <coughs> it occurred as we approached the little town of Bronte, Texas. The caravan was rolling along smoothly. Everything uh, was uh, uh, quiet for the moment, no problem. And we were passing through an area of scrub mesquite uh, as far as the eye could see. All of a sudden, we noticed a beautiful big black Cadillac parked near the high rise in this lonely sea of mesquite. We remarked about this unusual combination at the time, but thought no more about it. While we were parked in the square of Bronte, um, a lovely lady came up uh, to our car and asked me, would you like to see old Fort Cadman? I was simply thrilled speechless because we had been told that that was on private property and we would not be able to see Fort Cadman. She said if I would follow her, she would take us out there. I rounded up as many of the caravan as I could find. I got the photographer, thank goodness. I found Jim uh, Kolauer. I got uh, the, uh, the, uh, the editor, uh, uh, pa, Hugh Park, Father John, and Lynette, and we jumped in our car and turned around and followed the directions of this lovely lady and soon realized that we were following the beautiful black Cadillac we had seen parked earlier along the highway. Now this lady, lady turned out to be Mrs. C. H. Y., part owner of the fabulous ranch on which the remains of this historic fort uh, uh, are located. The Wileys now, uh, the Wiley Ranch now, have more than a hundred producing oil wells, and they have built a magnificent home within view of the remains of the old fort wall. Even the grass of their enormous garden was cut in squares and shipped from Florida. Their roses, uh, rose garden was indescribable. Some of the roses made, measured as much as six or seven inches in diameter. They took us in their magnificent home that was, uh, wa uh, the, whose walls were covered with hand painted paper. A perfectly beautiful place and gave us uh, uh, a drink of ice water, which we sadly needed uh, on that hot day, and then drove us down to the remains of the old fort. Uh, <coughs> they told us it would be impossible to have any privacy if they left the fort open to the public. But they thought, they thought that some of us on the caravan should have the experience of seeing the remains of that fort. For it was here that Ormsby had the terrifying experience of watching the men attempt to harness Six wild mules. In the process of harnessing on them, the mules ran off, turned the stage over, broke the top in, and Ormsby refused to get back into the stage until he was convinced the mules were worn out and would do no more damage. Another historic trail in Texas was a special trip that we were taken on to see the famous Castle Gap, where the Butterfield Stage went through the mountains down to the Horsehead Crossing on the Pecos River. This road is still only for stagecoaches, especially if it rains. Our driver, however, assured us he had a two-way radio in his car if it did rain. And rain it did. On that slick clay, his big car cut more papers than figure skaters on ice. But we made it back without having to call the record. What was some of the most, though, what was the most dramatic scene that you came in contact with? The most dramatic sight on the whole Butterfield Trail, to me, 
was Guadalupe Pass. Because it was at this point that the first westbound overland mail stagecoach met the first eastbound stagecoach on the salt flats at the foot of Guadalupe Pass. They stopped momentarily to reassure each other it was possible to complete the journey and keep the Butterfield schedule. A century later, Guadalupe Peak, the highest point in Texas, was used as a landmark for the early pilots. Our own dear Captain Brown started flying express planes for American back in the early days. And as he flew, he flew over the old Butterfield route using Guadalupe Peak as his checkpoint. As on beautiful days when he could see the ground, he noticed endless miles of traces of, of old roads across the desert, and he wondered what they were. This sparked his curiosity, and after inquiring, found out that he was flying the Butterfield stage mail route. He became so intrigued with this facet of our history that he became an authority on the subject and was later appointed national coordinator for the Butterfield Overland Mail Centennial. His group, his interest uh, in uh, early flying experiences inspired him to get a group of pioneer pilots together. And headed by Red Moser, they had designed a huge monument which was to be placed on top of, Guad of Guadalupe Peak as a reminder of the days when the pilots flew that route without the beam to guide them. This was a beautiful tetragonal uh, marker, and on the day that the Centennial Caravan arrived at the Pioneer Station, which is at the foot of the peak, this marker was dedicated. But we missed uh, much of the beautiful and meaningful ceremony because the night before, life had called us in, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, Life Magazine, had called us in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and said, we are sending a photographer, A.Y. Owens, out to the Pioneer to take pictures of your in the stagecoach uh, tomorrow. Now they said, we must have a section of road uh, where there is no indication of any modern life. There must be a little uh, dust that will, uh, uh, must be on a dusty road so that the dust will indicate speed of the stage. After a conference with Mr. J.C. Hunter, Jr., who owns the enormous ranch in the area of the Pioneer Station, we picked a spot some five miles uh, long where we could take a picture on a ranch road leading up to the farming house. It was a perfect spot. No light poles, no telephone wires, nor a table. Manette and I put on our costumes and rode as passengers. The photographer had us repeat this run several times at a gallop. One time, one of the leaders fell down and was dragged for a short distance. So, at long last, Big Red had a chance to serve in the team until the leader uh, uh, recuperated. The colored pictures taken by Owens were magnificent. We were told they were to be used on the cover of Life magazine the day we arrived in San Francisco. But unfortunately for both, the dear Pope died on that day, and his picture was used instead. So Mildred, who paid for this trip? <coughs> Since each family paid their own expenses, the free meals and lodging along the way were certainly appreciated. We were served 32 banquets in all. We ate chicken all through Missouri and Arkansas. We ate barbecue all through Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. Although all of the meals were good, there were some that will forever stand out in my memory. One was the chain, was a chain of a 
a simple, plain, old-fashioned stew, which was served by the Chamber of Commerce at Wilcox, Arizona. Another was a fried fish dinner at Gila Bend, and the third was a Chinese dinner, the likes of which I had never eaten, at Porterville, California. Someone told me one time that you uh, had an encounter with some priests. Could you tell us about that? <coughs> yes, when, uh, when we uh, uh, reached Tucson, from there on through California, we really met up with some people. <coughs> they represented different groups. Uh, each one had some acts they wanted uh, us to help them grind, or they wanted to get in uh, to the pictures at the stage with the stagecoach. There were political nuts who wanted to be allowed to ride on the stagecoach. There were drunkards uh, who wanted to drive the stagecoach. There were labor radicals. There were metaphysical uh, practitioners. And even a nut from a nudist camp wanted to join. But after 2,795 miles, Stopping at more at 231 towns, driving in 31 parades, participating in an average of 10 parades and celebrations for over tw for 24 days, we were relieved to see the end of Market Street. Oh, thank you very much, Mildred. I'm sure that all who hear this case will join me in thanking you for telling us about this memorable and historical trip. This case will be continued with interviews of the other three members of Mrs. Frizzell's family who will give highlights of their experiences on the 1958 rerun of the 1858 Butterfield Overland Mail from Tipton, Missouri to San Francisco.